the one trusting in being a Baptist. Here in falls the one trusting in church rules or church experience or the certain morality list that you have that you think that you're right with God. You have nothing if you don't have Christ. If you have Christ, you need nothing. Amen. Verse number 9 through 12 are very simple and will take very little time. I want to read them, but it is back to the illustration of Abraham and just making clear that this is to everyone, not just to Jews. It says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, verse 9, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision? Or in uncircumcision, not in circumcision. That means Abraham was not called righteous uh, 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 after he had been circumcised, but before he had been circumcised, but in uncircumcision. Look at verse number 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. A lot of verses about circumcision, uncircumcision. What's the argument here? Please follow, and then we're done. Since the example of verse number 1 through 4 was Abraham, the father of the Jews, the question is, is it only the Jews, only the circumcised in verse number 9, who can be counted righteous by just simply having faith in Christ? Is this only something that is counts for the, for the Jews? It's strange, and some of you are very sharp, that you've seen in the, in the preaching, this is the second time this question is asked. Turn over to, to chapter 3, just look there in verse number 29 of chapter 3. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not? Okay, this, this is the same question asked again. Why? It doesn't mean anything to us hardly. Okay, because we understand it beyond this, and here we are in America. But in the early days of the church, this was an argument. It was an argument because the Jewish believers thought that they had the corner on the market. They didn't really like the idea of Gentiles getting saved. I sure do like that God liked the idea of Gentiles getting saved. Uh, that's a good thing, all right? They didn't like it. So it was a big argument. They held council of Jerusalem over and all this. The answer comes back in verse number 10 and 11. In, in uh, Genesis 15, verse 6, when Abraham believed in the Lord, here's the answer. And he counted it from righteousness, verse 10 and 11. It was before God gave Abraham the mark or the sign of circumcision. You say, you know, why are we talking about this medical thing, circumcision, like babies, you know, baby boys? Why are we talking about that? Because, listen, that started not as a medical condition that you do for, you know, all that, okay? I'm not going to embarrass myself. What it started as was a sign that you, that Abraham, was first given Abraham to do, because that would show that he was the beginning of the chosen people of God. And then from that point on, all Jews, all Hebrews, would be circumcised as a mark to show that they're different from the rest of the men of the world. It was a sign. It was a mark. What's the point? It doesn't matter who believes on Christ for forgiveness of sins, Jews or Gentiles, circumcised or uncircumcised, all are saved by imputation. All are made righteous in Christ alone. All. God told Abraham to be circumcised as a sign of faith, a seal of righteousness that is by faith without works. But that did not happen until after he was declared righteous. So you understand? It doesn't matter that you're a Jew. It doesn't matter that you're circumcised or uncircumcised if you're marked as a Jew or not a Jew. The deal is Christ alone saves. This is the argument here. The argument of Abraham was that he believed in the Lord and was counted him for righteousness, not that he was circumcised and was counted him for righteousness. It was no act of work on his part. And that's the point he wants to make to you. It's no act of work on your part. I don't know if you've ever sang that little children's song, Father Abraham had many sons. How many of you know that song? Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, right arm, left arm. What, what does the song, I, I used to sing that song and say, I'm not father, it's not my father, my dad's name's Raymond. <laughs> I didn't understand it. Listen to the song. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you, so let's just praise the Lord. Every Sunday school teacher, every junior church teacher, listen to me. When you sing that song, explain the theology. And here it is. I am a son of Abraham because Abraham believed God and was counted him to righteousness, and I express faith in Christ alone, and it's counted to me for righteousness. That's how I, that Abraham is my father. 
understand that? And that is the argument of verse 12, or verse 11, and verse 12, explaining all of that. Tonight, let me apply this right now. Will you let this wonderful doctrine of imputation, of righteousness counted to you, apply itself into the recess of your confidence and your assurance and your trust that you are saved tonight? Will you realize even more how solid you are in the hope of eternal life if you are clinging only to Christ? Will you be happy in it and enjoy the truth of imputation? Will you stand in it? Will you trust in Christ and enjoy it? Will you throw off lesser thoughts of fears and guilt of the past? And will you live the enjoyment of the theology that the positive column says righteousness of Christ when God looks at you and the negative column says nothing and can never say anything because you're Teflon. St sin doesn't stick to you anymore. We have some young people in the room that have no idea what Teflon is. When you go home, explain to your children, take the pan out. Do you see this? Put an egg in it. <laughs> Great theology. I close with another application. That's application one. The second application is this. We must be mature in our salvation doctrine and language in this. We are in a culture of vague evangelicalism. We are in a culture where, where people really don't know what saves anyone. This just, you get under the umbrella of Jesus. What? Devil believes in Jesus. He trembles about it. We must not promise or think that any act will save other than faith on Christ. We cannot promise a man that he can be saved by walking an aisle or praying this prayer. We don't know his heart. And we're very close to promising a false assurance to that man. Only him and God knows whether his faith is in Christ alone. Don't ever, don't you dare give a man assurance like I did, five-year-old Nathan, in that post on my Facebook account that I told you of this morning. Don't do it. It's not honest. And I would never give Nathan a false hope. When men like, and I'm sorry we have visitors, we, we just speak the truth here, like the Apostle Paul. You know, I'm not into this, you know, let's all join hands and not name names. Whenever I try to infer something, it, no one gets it, so I'm going to have to you know, say it straight. When men like Joel Osteen preaches a Christless message of folklore and feel-good-ism, and then adds at the end, pray this little prayer about Jesus, and we believe you got saved. There is no sin there preached. There's no realization of needing a Savior. There's no Christ. There's no cross. There's no substitutionary death. There's no explanation of how Christ atoned, that you're hopeless and worthless. In fact, you've been told the whole message. You've been, you've been told for 30 minutes that you're great. Why do I need a Savior? It's lies. Countless men become confident with that kind of promise and that kind of preaching without any trust on Jesus Christ, where there is no gospel preached, there is no salvation. Don't forget Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth. It's not the handy prayer at the end. It is the details of the gospel that opens men's hearts and minds, that they are wicked sinners, that Christ is the only way. My hope is only in Christ. I cling to Christ. I believe on Christ. And that's what saves a man. Thousands will perish in their sin because their trust was on some act or some work, whether that be a prayed prayer or baptism or church membership or walking an aisle or having an emotional guilty moment, whatever. At the end of life's day, what saves a man is trusting faith in only Christ's imputed perfect life and redeeming death to make him righteous. Faith is not a work, but rather clinging to the work of another. Christ alone. Stand with me, please.